Resveratrol is really being discussed a lot right now, especially in the longevity community. Dr. David Sinclair is someone who has really been talking about it a lot. But recently, the discussion has been coming up surrounding absorption. How do we absorb it more? Now, recently, Dr. David Sinclair suggested that you take resveratrol with olive oil. And I've been seeing a lot of people talking about that all over the internet, but it's just raising the question of how do we improve absorption and is it something that we should be concerned with? Let me first start off by saying resveratrol I personally feel is an amazing compound. Okay? Antioxidant properties, anti-inflammatory properties, and when it comes down to the longevity world, where it's being investigated is its potential to operate similarly to caloric restriction by activating specific genes, by activating sirtuins. So it may indirectly have sort of an effect kind of like caloric restriction. There's even some interesting research suggesting that resveratrol can induce autophagy, which is like the cellular recycling of specific components of cells. So very interesting stuff. And I'm a big proponent of resveratrol and I recommend people take it, but we have to investigate how it should be taken to maximize the effect. Now, additionally, there's some cool research that's been coming out, this particular study published in Diabetic Studies. So this one found that by consuming resveratrol, you can actually have a positive impact metabolically on glucose utilization. It inhibits uh, an enzyme that breaks down glucose into sorbitol. So basically, you're slowing carbohydrate digestion, but you're also protecting the body from the oxidative stress that comes as a result of sorbitol. Additionally, they're seeing that resveratrol may have an effect on driving up AMPK as well. This is huge because this can play a role in how we utilize glucose in the body. So not only are we looking at resveratrol from a potential longevity perspective, but possibly a metabolic optimization perspective as well. So then we talk about absorption. Okay, and I'll get to what Dr. David Sinclair was talking about specifically in a second. Okay, resveratrol is actually absorbed quite well when it's taken in what's called a trans-resveratrol form. That's like a really bioavailable form. So it's not necessarily an absorption issue with it. It's more about when it gets to the liver, it metabolizes very quickly. And a lot of times that can sort of have a sloppy response where you have a high degree of metabolites like sulfate, okay? So these metabolites can be hard to deal with. There's some evidence that suggests that these metabolites might actually help regenerate uh, resveratrol back into its whole form again. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's get into the olive oil discussion. So here's the thing. Olive oil is part of a Mediterranean diet. Resveratrol in its whole food form is part of a Mediterranean diet. So it makes sense to support that lifestyle by grouping them together. But there's some interesting research that we need to look at. There was a study that was published in the journal Diseases. It took a look at the consumption of straight extra virgin olive oil, the consumption of only red wine, and the consumption of red wine plus extra virgin olive oil. And it wanted to look at overall resveratrol related compounds in the urine six hours later. So what kind of uh, breakdown components of resveratrol was seen in the urine? Well, they found with olive oil only, zero, because there's no resveratrol. With red wine, there was a little bit. With red wine plus olive oil, there was a little bit more, but not statistically significant. So there wasn't enough to really notice a huge difference, but enough of a difference for some people to say, ah, there was better absorption. The thing is, is it fits the model of supporting the Mediterranean lifestyle and the Mediterranean diet, which I am a huge proponent of, so I agree with that. And I don't think there's any harm in taking olive oil with it, but it looks like it's pretty negligible. However, there was an interesting study published in Drug Design Development and Therapies that took a look at 28 different pharmaceutical compounds and different ways to deliver them, all of which utilized olive oil. All of the 28 methods that had olive oil improved the dissolution of the pharmaceutical, improved the dissolution of the drug. What is this suggesting? It's suggesting that it doesn't matter if it's olive oil and resveratrol or olive oil and kitty litter. It might help the absorption of it. And it's probably simple mechanics. The fact that you're creating this oil water immersion that's creating or increasing the surface area. So you have better absorption through what's called basically the intestinal lymphatic system. So basically you're potentially extracting more. So that means that maybe taking any vitamin or anything with fat could be a good thing, whether it's water soluble or not, because you create an oil water immersion that creates more surface area for better potential absorption. So olive oil specifically, not super concerned with it. However, there's a bunch of benefits of olive oil anyway. So sure, take it with olive oil, it's not gonna hurt. 
the kind of resveratrol that you take is probably the most important thing for absorption. And we're going to talk about different things that you can still take with it, but making sure that you get trans resveratrol and making sure that it's kept in a dark bottle, making sure that it's kept cool and it's not being exposed to other stressors like light, like heat, things like that. Okay, now you're seeing it combined with a lot of things. One of the companies that I'm a huge fan of, a company called Verso, they actually combine trans resveratrol with what's called nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN. If you're in the uh, longevity research space and you're just curious about this, you've probably heard it talked about a lot. Dr. David Sinclair has talked about NMN and the combination of NMN or NR with trans resveratrol. Uh, the one that I recommend is Verso. I did go ahead and put a link down below. They are a sponsor on this channel. I'm not saying that it's going to diagnose, cure, treat anything, but I will say the people that run it are top-notch people and they run a really good company with a really good product. And it absolutely has my stamp of approval. In terms of all of the NMNs that are out there, this is the one that I think has the most just heart behind it. Okay, they really put their heart and soul into developing a good product. And they also make it so that it's stored in the cold. So it's cold storage and then it's shipped to you really fast. And that way you can put it directly in your fridge and you can get on with your business and you don't have to worry about this high degree of oxidation that might occur with other ones. So a really cool product. So a way to get NMN along with trans resveratrol. So again, that link down below. So big thanks to Verso. The next one to talk about is black pepper or piperine. Now again, if you've been around the block, you've probably heard curcumin, like turmeric, uh, talked about in tandem with black pepper, piperine. It can help improve the absorption of it. Well, similar potentially with resveratrol. So let's look at the research there. There was a study that was published in the journal Molecular Nutrition and Food Research. Okay, now this was a rodent model study, but it was pretty darn interesting. They took a look at resveratrol along with piperine, which is the extract that you get out of black pepper, and they found that there was a 1,544% increase in serum resveratrol and 229% overall exposure, resveratrol exposure. This is pretty darn phenomenal. Now, what's going on here? Well, it looks like the piperine slows the metabolism of it, okay? And now by doing so, it's inhibiting a specific enzyme. The inhibition of this enzyme is gonna lead to what is called less glucuronate, okay? Glucuronate is a byproduct of the resveratrol metabolism. So by inhibiting this enzyme that normally would break down resveratrol and leave this byproduct, we are left with more available resveratrol and less of the negative byproduct. Here's the downside. This has not successfully been replicated in humans. It has been done in rodents, but it hasn't worked in humans. Does that mean it's never gonna work in humans? No, it could just be a design thing, but we have to remember this happens sometimes. This is exactly why we evolved from in vitro studies to rodent models to human models, okay? Because sometimes it works in rodents and doesn't work in humans. So is this bad news for resveratrol? No, if anything, it's good news because it means it has a prospect of working, but it's not necessary, okay? So the point with this, and I've got one more thing to talk about, is that olive oil, black pepper, certainly not gonna hurt to take it with it, but it probably isn't a necessity. But now let's talk about a cool benefit from adding quercetin in. Now quercetin is something that you can get from capers, you can get it from berries, you can get it in a supplement form. It's talked about a lot, huge benefits with quercetin, but specifically surrounding how it works in tandem with resveratrol is pretty darn cool. There was a study published in Xenobiotica that took a look at quercetin and found that it inhibited sulfation. So sulfate is another compound that is a byproduct of the metabolism of resveratrol. And if you have too much of the sulfate, the body has to deal with it and has to clear it, or at least metabolize it more to a certain degree. So if we have less in the way of sulfate, then less the body has to deal with. However, there was not an increase in resveratrol availability. Still a win, because you're decreasing the effect of that sulfate long-term, but you're not necessarily improving how much resveratrol is available. But now there's a really cool study that was published in Experimental and Therapeutic Medicine. This was cool because again, it looked at mice, but it put mice on an 11 week high fat diet to make them obese. It induced obesity by putting them on a high calorie, high fat diet for 11 weeks. Okay, then it put them on a combination of quercetin and resveratrol. Now remember earlier how I talked about resveratrol potentially having a positive impact uh, when it comes down to AMPK, when it comes down to insulin uh, sensitivity? Well, this could have been playing the role there because when they put them on these compounds together, they saw a decrease in body fat, a 
decrease in visceral fat, a decrease in inflammation that was associated with adipokines, so uh, basically cytokines that are directly from fat cells, okay, and then also an increase or a decrease, excuse me, in tumor necrosis factor alpha and a decrease in interleukin-6. Okay, biomarkers across the board decrease, body fat decrease, very good stuff that we wanted to see. Additionally, there is a reduced obesity-induced suppression of AMPK and SIRT1. What this means is that when you are obese, you suppress AMPK and you suppress SIRT1, which is a longevity gene, if you want to call it that. So obesity, or being overweight, has a negative effect on aging. Well, it turns out that this combination seemed to reduce the suppression of these compounds as related to obesity. Meaning these obese mice, when they took in quercetin and resveratrol, they didn't have as much of a negative impact on their aging as the other mice did. So pretty interesting stuff. Again, not concrete in its rodent model, but it's something to pay attention to. So when you look at this, what's the general consensus? Take it with food and maybe it's better. It doesn't have to be olive oil, it could be any oil. It doesn't have to be piperine. We don't know if that works. It doesn't have to be a copious amount of quercetin. You could take it with a little bit of soybean oil and a mulberry if you wanted to. Not that that's going to give you a lot of nutritional value. The point is resveratrol seems to be best taken with food, although the evidence is still bleak. The form of resveratrol that you take, transvesveratrol, is probably the most important factor. But what is really cool is all the buzz surrounding resveratrol. One last thing we have to pay attention to is that resveratrol has the potential to regenerate. And this is a discussion that we're starting to look at. We're starting to really understand that maybe these compounds, the sulfate, the glurokinidase, that can convert back into resveratrol. If that's the case, do we need to worry about absorbing every last little fraction of it? Possibly not, but we still need to worry about the overall intake of resveratrol, whether through food or supplement form. As always, keep it locked in and I'll see you tomorrow.